Thank you very much. And now we have that fun opportunity to talk about the 2016 election with Justin Raimondo. Raimondo is an author and editorial director at antiwar.com, where he writes regular, a regular column. He's also a regular contributor to the American Conservative and Chronicles magazine. He has also written a handful of books on US foreign policy, as well as on the conservative movement. And his talk today is titled, Israel and Foreign Policy Issues in the Presidential Campaign. Let's do a little experiment. Now, I realize that what most people remember about the recent Republican presidential debates is the vulgarity, the inanity, the name calling, the references to hand length. But there have been a few moments of lucidity when history has been made, precedents have been set, and yes, even reasons for optimism have been highlighted although these may have been lost amid all the brouhaha and the liberal moralizing. So on to our experiment. Which candidate said the following? Quote, as president, there is nothing that I would rather do than to bring peace to Israel and its neighbors generally. And I think it serves no purpose to say, but you have a good guy and a bad guy. Now, I may not be successful in doing it. It's probably the toughest negotiation anywhere in the world of any kind, OK? <laughs> but it doesn't help if I start saying, I am very pro-Israel, very pro, more than anybody on the stage. But it doesn't do any good to start demeaning the neighbors, because I would love to do something with regard to negotiating peace, finally, for Israel and for their neighbors. And I can't do that as well as a negotiator. I cannot do that as well if I am taking sides, end quote. OK. Now, I'm going to give you a few seconds to contemplate the answer. I mean. Here is a rare example of a Republican candidate speaking reasonably, rationally, in a statesmanlike manner about one of the most controversial issues in American politics. Here is someone who is defying the bipartisan consensus on Israeli-American relations, which is that we must always give unstinting and unconditional support to the Jewish state. Here is an outright abrogation of the conditions of the so-called special relationship, that one-sided love affair that dictates Washington must kowtow to Tel Aviv and ignore the horrific conditions under which Palestinians must live. OK, you had enough time, so what's the answer? <laughs> Who would dare to step on the third rail of American politics and defy the Israel lobby? The answer has to be Donald Trump, doesn't it? And indeed, it is. He said it in Houston. He said it in Detroit. He said it on Fox News. And the two other main contenders attacked him for it, both Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. And of course, they didn't have a substantial criticism. There can't be any. After all, how can one argue against even-handedness? Cruz merely repeated his pledge to give Israel everything it wants and more, while Rubio repeated the Israeli embassy's talking points. Hamas is evil, Hezbollah is terrorist, and of course, moral equivalence is immoral. In short, the usual nonsense, as if the Palestinians and their local allies have no right to resist the occupation. Yet Trump stood his ground. He's repeated his position in at least two debates. And wonder of wonders has suffered not at all for it at the ballot box. It was quite astonishing after the uh, one debate, they have a North Carolina uh, primary, and oh, Trump is finished. 
part 99. And of course he wasn't, was he? Um, he is the front runner by a country mile. And the only flack he's gotten over it has been from the usual suspects, the neoconservatives, who you just heard about, who hated him anyway and are among his loudest detractors. Bill Kristol's so-called Emergency Committee for Israel ran an ad attacking him, but not, interestingly enough, over his support for even-handedness in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. They didn't want to go there. That's because Trump has single-handedly changed the terms of the debate without hardly anyone noticing, and of course, without hardly anyone giving him any credit for it. Israel is no longer the third rail of American politics, not since the rise of Donald Trump, which no candidate dares step in for fear of his or her political future. How did he do it? by simply and fearlessly telling the truth. Of course, some people did notice. The Israel lobby, first of all, and in Israel itself, panic has set in. An interesting piece by Kemi Shalev, usually one of the more reasonable Zionists, notes that, quote, in their Super Tuesday speeches, Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio tried to use an Israel hammer to bash Donald Trump. Cruz sneeringly lambasted him for saying that he would remain neutral, while Rubio trounced Trump for trying to stay impartial, as his audience booed accordingly. And Trump? Trump was racking up victories, amassing delegates, and laughing all the way to the top of the Republican presidential field. I'm still quoting. In this way, the New York billionaire is decimating the conventional wisdom, one of many, that in 2016, total and unconditional support for Israel is a prerequisite for any aspiring Republican candidate wishing to run for president, unquote. Remember when the support of evangelical Christians was contingent on a candidate's willingness to grovel before Bibi Netanyahu? Poor Rand Paul, for example, the alleged anti-interventionist, isolationist, and fellow libertarian, uh, had to travel all the way to Israel, cuddle up to the Israeli right wing, and pointedly ignore the Palestinians whom he didn't even dine to visit. And where did it get him? Just amused disdain from the Jewish Republican coalition and a series of televised ads from a dark money pro-Israel group attacking him for his trouble. Appeasement, it seems, doesn't work when it comes to dealing with the Israel lobby. But one tactic does seem to work, a direct an honest assault. As Shalev notes, notes in Haaretz, Southern evangelicals voted for Trump anyway, and in droves. They handed him victories in Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, Virginia, and elsewhere. As Shalev puts it, quote, the conception is falling apart. The notion that the Republican Party is a monolithic bastion of support that we will withstand, uh, that, that will withstand for the test of time is evaporating. The belief that any Republican president who will follow Obama will, will be better for Israel is eroding which, with each passing day. Faced with the Trump phenomenon, Netanyahu's fortress GOP strategy is collapsing like a house of cards, end quote. So this is what they're seeing and saying in, in Israel. The supposed in, invincibility of the Israel lobby has been a long time unraveling. But the process began a couple of years ago with their first big defeat over the nomination of Chuck Hagel as Defense Secretary. Senator Cruz, in particular, took center stage during this seminal battle. 
during his imitation of, doing his imitation of Joe McCarthy in impugning Hegel's integrity and accusing his supporters of being, quote, friends of Hamas, whatever that may mean. It didn't work and the Obama administration grew bolder, taking the initiative in defying the lobby and becoming more vocal in its criticism of Israel and its settlement building. But it took a Republican, it took Donald Trump to deal the Israel lobby a death blow, breaking its stranglehold on the Republican Party and defying the interdict against even-handedness in dealing with the occupation. The Israel lobby, for all its legendary wealth and influence, was always a paper tiger, and it was inevitable that this would eventually happen. As Shaleb points out, there is no going back. Quote, every time Cruz and Rubio try to hit Trump over the head with an Israel club and nothing happens, it is Israel's weakness that is exposed. Every time Trump wins a party primary without a challenge from his supporters, another nail is driven into the coffin of the unshakable alliance between Israel and America's deep right, quote unquote. That alliance is now being shaken to its very foundations, and the panic extends to the Democratic Party where Haim Sabin, or Saban, excuse me, the billionaire whose great achievement has been the creation of mighty Morphin Rangers, is denouncing Trump as quote unquote unreliable when it comes to supporting Israel. Calling the Republican frontrunner a clown and dangerous, he ranted in an interview with Israel's Channel 2 that Trump is quote, dangerous for the world, and since Israel is part of the world, therefore, he's dangerous for Israel, okay? As Trump would say, okay. <laughs> and especially dangerous, it seems, for those who consider Israel to be the moral equivalent of the entire world. Says Saban, it is hard to know what he is thinking one day, he'll give an interview to an Israeli newspaper and say, you've never had such a friend in the White House as you will when I become president. The next day, they ask him about the Middle East, and he says, I'm neutral. I'm the UN. I won't involve myself. You just don't know with him. Every day, it's something else, unquote. <laughs> Nothing less than complete and total support satisfies people like Saban. Anything else is dangerous for Israel. Saban, by the way, is one of Hillary Clinton's longtime supporters. He has given her millions of dollars and is the single biggest donor to the Democratic congressional campaign. He has a net worth of $3.6 billion. Now, what's really significant about Trump's stance is that if, as president, he tries to make a deal in an even-handed way and it all falls through, Israel will be blamed, as Kemi Shalev rightly says in Haaretz. That's because, for domestic political reasons, the Israeli leadership cannot and will not make any significant concessions, which is why they view Trump's even-handedness with absolute horror. And that will show the world what Israel is really all about, deepening the rift between Washington and Tel Aviv, and perhaps even calling US financial support to the Jewish state into question. After all, if Trump is critical of having to pay for the defense of Japan, Korea, and our European allies without getting without getting much of anything in return, what's to stop him from taking the same dim view of our yearly tribute of $3.5 billion to Israel and getting bupkis for our generosity? <laughs> the dam is broken. The great breakthrough is upon us. And the great irony is that it came about because of a politician 
widely reviled by liberals and especially by Muslims for his undisguised hostility to people of the Muslim faith. Who would have thought that this man of all men would sound a reasonable note on the issue of U.S.-Israeli relations? Yet history is full of such ironies, and I would advise you not to let your shock at the rather counterintuitive notion of a reasonable Donald Trump blind you to the unfolding political reality. Bernie Sanders, another outsider, has expressed support for a more even-handed approach, albeit in much vaguer terms. And his stance on the whole issue of Israel has been given much less prominence by his campaign, whereas Trump has given voice to his position in at least two high-profile debates and taken lots of heat for it. An article in The Intercept by Murtaza Hussein fails to cite Trump's position accurately or in full, while noting that this is new territory for Sanders, who has been supportive of Israel, including even during the heinous attacks on Gaza in the past. This is to be expected. Trump's hostility to Muslims, per se, isn't going to endear him to politically correct liberals who don't want to give him credit for anything. What's going to be interesting is that both Sanders and Trump are scheduled to speak at the upcoming APAC conference, and so we'll see what happens there. <laughs> and I have to note that our friends at Code Pink are circulating a petition urging Sanders not to attend the APAC event. Okay, well, can we take that later? Let me finish here. And one has to wonder if they're afraid he'll continue his long career of pandering to the Jewish state and its American supporters, while Trump is surely not going to change or modify his position in any way, as usual. The Israel lobby is very concerned about Trump. The neoconservatives who direct it are vehemently opposed to him because he challenges the very basis of America's interventionist foreign policy, which they have supported on ideological grounds as well as its obvious benefits to Israel. Trump's statement that the US was deliberately lied into the Iraq war has enraged them to the point that neocon chief strategist Bill Kristol has called for a third party candidate to oppose him. Neocon Max Boot has said he'd vote for Stalin before <laughs> voting for, for, presumably he'd write in Trotsky. And to a man, the neocons are frothing at the mouth that Trump is winning primary after primary. To which I can only add, by their enemies, ye shall know them. Thank you. Yes, I, you know, I just wanted to make a comment about the Sanders. Uh, you're telling me that he did not accept the nomination. Uh, the invitation to speak, and of course, that's out of sheer sheer cowardice. Um, you know, I mean, he, he doesn't want to alienate his radical left wing supporters who are so busy disrupting Trump's rallies that they don't even really care what his positions are. And uh, so um, it's 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 just very consistent with his reticence on the on the issue of. Israel, and I might add that uh, at a town hall meeting on this subject uh, in his district in Vermont, I believe it is, um, he once threw somebody out of the room for daring to ask about his position on the Israeli-Palestinian uh, 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 conflict. So, so much for liberal moralizing on, on that issue and their big hero, Bernie Sanders. <laughs> 